Holy Father, hallowed be thy name. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> John Donne, in his book, The Search for God in Time and Memory, talks about the utilization of stories in Scripture to speak to us in ways more profound than just the simple transmission of information. When we study the events that comprise God's revelation of himself, we identify with the persons and their circumstances, and we make application to the circumstances of our lives. Now, the passage read this morning about Jacob is such a story. It reverberates with power, for it is about the climax of a great man's spiritual journey. There is something of Jacob in us all. So join me now as together we share this dark night of the soul of Jacob, soon to be Israel. In order to understand the events of the text, we have to go back some years. Jacob, from his birth, lived by his wits. His name means supplanter or trickster. Taking advantage of his brother Esau, Jacob succeeds in taking Esau's birthright. The foolish Esau, famished with hunger, trades it for a mess of pottage. But much more significantly, with the collusion of his mother, Rebekah, Jacob pretends to be Esau, preparing food for Isaac, his blind father, donning the skin of a sheep to simulate his brother's hairy body, lying directly to his father about his identity. And so the prized blessing of the father upon his eldest son is given not to Esau, but to the supplanter, Jacob. One can hear the anguish, the anger of Esau when he realizes what has happened. The scripture says, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But Isaac said, Your brother came with guile, and he has taken away your blessing. Then Esau said, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept and determined to kill Jacob upon the death of his father. And so it is that the young Jacob must flee for his life. He will never again see his mother. He heads out across the wilderness to make his way in the world, alone, young, perhaps shamed by what he has done, certainly chastened by the consequences of his actions. He is a fugitive from hearth and kin. When Jacob arrives at Bethel, he makes his bed in the open with a stone for a pillow, and there he dreams that a ladder is set up between heaven and the earth with angels descending and ascending. And at the top of the ladder, there is God standing there. And God speaks a promise to Jacob. He says that all the nations of the earth will bless themselves by him and his descendants. Behold, says God, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done that of which I have spoken to you. Well, Jacob is taken by this direct revelation from God and decides he will make a response. He makes a vow. He takes a rock and anoints it with oil. The rock is to be a witness to what he's vowing, and this is his vow. If God will be with me and keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Not exactly an unconditional promise, but nevertheless, for the young Jacob, a major commitment. The years that pass are full of adventure, and we do not have time to cover them all, but suffice it to say that Jacob is blessed with two wives two concubines, 11 sons, and a daughter, and in addition has accumulated great wealth. By his wits and the blessing of God, 
He escapes from his father-in-law Laban, and as our story continues, is about to meet, after these many years of absence, the brother he so grievously wronged and wounded. By servants, Jacob sends ahead presents of livestock to his brother Esau, hoping to placate to some extent any abiding wrath. Further, he has taken his 12 children, his wives and concubines and all his possessions and sent them across the ford of the stream Jabbok. Tomorrow, tomorrow, he will finally meet Esau again. And this night, he is as he was as a young man, alone and frightened, facing an unknown and dangerous future. The difference is that he is no longer a callow youth, no longer a relative innocent, no longer under any illusions about the difficulties and dangers to himself and his family the future may hold. That night, the angel of the Lord comes and wrestles with Jacob until the breaking of the day. Now, in order to understand the significance of what is happening, we need to know that Jacob is wrestling in the dark. He knows that this is the angel of God, and he believes that if he sees the angel, he will die. For the Hebrews believe that no man could look upon the form of God and live. Now this is not a mild or gentle wrestling match. The struggle is so violent that Jacob's hip is put out of joint. And at one point the angel of God says to Jacob, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. In essence, Jacob is saying, Bless me or kill me. Then the angel asks, What is your name? Jacob responds, Jacob, supplanter, trickster, cheat. Then the angel says, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and prevailed. The angel blesses Jacob, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. Now that is an old, old story. But if we will allow, it will speak to our contemporary condition with surprising power. You see, Jacob is every person. His journey is like our own in broad brushstrokes. All of us attempt to get by by our wits. We do that because we soon learn that no one takes care of number one like number one. And since it is easy to conclude that life is a zero-sum game, we do not start out as altruistic or self-sacrificing people. Scheming to get our way, to protect ourselves, to make ourselves comfortable, is as natural as breath. When we are young, perhaps away from home, beginning a new and challenging adventure, particularly one that is fraught with danger and fear, many do turn to God. For God is constantly seeking to break into our lives. And some, even some who have very little knowledge of the transcendent, find themselves arrested by His glorious presence. But for most, it is not as if we had no religious background. Most of us have been blessed with a structure of belief, that we more or less accepted as the way the world was. Jacob, too, had good training. His dream in the wilderness did not spring forth full-blown from his forehead. Rather, it was the situation of uncertainty, the guilt and the danger combined with the overlay of training that opened God to the revelation of God's will for his life. His complacent self-sufficiency was shattered and Jacob heard the voice of God. Suddenly, that which had sort of always just been there was critically important. Jacob had to make a personal decision. Is my life going to appeal to the protection, support, and strength of God? 
or am I truly on my own? Do I reject all power save the power of my right arm? Fortunately, Jacob made the decision to accept the promise of God. And it is likely that on many a starlit night as the years rolled on, Jacob looked up and wondered about the promise he had made, the God to whom he had made it, and the influence of his covenant with God. He wondered what it all meant. Where was he heading? What was his destiny? What did the future hold for him? I suspect that most of us have had transcendent moments. Perhaps it was when you were near the end of your strength in some difficult and critical labor. Or perhaps for those who have known military combat, when the ground shook with the indescribable power and fury of exploding ordnance, when your mortality was terribly, fearfully driven home. Or perhaps it was in childbirth or holding a sick child and realizing that your own efforts were inadequate to meet the needs of the moment. It may have been a time of personal temptation when your integrity and control of your life teetered on the edge of the abyss. Perhaps it was just the sudden realization that life was too big and too complicated and too unpredictable to handle without the help of God. Then it was that the overlay of training coupled with the demands of the hour, needed to become, and I trust did become, a personal covenant with God. But our spiritual journey does not end with the covenants made in our youth or young adulthood. For though we may not often contemplate where we are going, there is an inexorable quality to life. I sometimes tell people and remind myself that ultimately the doctor has bad news for us all. The energies of life shut down. Our ability to control our lives is revealed to us as weak. Now that occurs earlier for some than others, but we may be absolutely sure that the day is coming when by the grace of God we confront the full truth of the fact that we were made by and for God, that our safety security, meaning, and purpose, the maintenance of all our dreams and hopes are tied up in the covenant relationship to which God calls us. For middle-aged Jacob, it was the confrontation with a brother he had desperately wronged and who had sworn to kill him. He understood that he was at the mercy of Esau. And of course, Esau came with an army of 400 men. Only if by the grace of God the heart of his brother was softened. Only if Esau were willing to forgive the terrible offense of the young Jacob could he hope for the safety of his family and himself. And so, in a way that he had never done before, Jacob turned to God. The imagery of the wrestling is vivid. This was no calm petition, no reasoned discourse, no cool and controlled contract. No, this was the desperate striving of a frightened and weak man who nevertheless possessed enough faith to cast himself upon the mercies of God. He, in a sense, died to self. When he cries out, bless me or kill me, he gives himself away. And discovered, as have countless millions, that giving oneself away is the key to the security and blessing God offers to all of those who will trust Him. We did not create ourselves. We cannot sustain ourselves. All we can do is entrust ourselves to God, who did create and does sustain. And when we do that, we enter into the joy of our Lord. As with Jacob, we become new persons. Even the name changes. No longer tempster, trickster, supplanter, or cheat, Jacob finally becomes Israel, he who has striven with God and prevailed. <clears throat> John Shazby's autobiographical account entitled Birthright 
tells of a man of God who for much of his life served God but with a barren spirit. He acknowledges that he was a legalist, seeking to serve God by being obedient to his commands. He tells us that self-examination and confession and repentance, a sense of unworthiness, were constant in his life. As he says, no matter where I went, what I did, fear was my constant traveling companion. I never felt good enough, obedient enough, holy enough, never felt I did enough, and never felt that what I had done was good enough. His ministry was outwardly successful, but inwardly he was miserable. All of this came to a climax in 1981. He resigned his church, left his wife and children with her parents, and took a small travel trailer to the mouth of the Igoda River. And in that isolated environment began a month-long struggle to find out who he was, who God was, and what the Christian life was really all about. It was an intense struggle like Jacob's, wrestling with the Lord, crying out with Jacob, bless me or kill me. So God granted him a spiritual breakthrough. He came to understand that he was not just a servant of God, but a son of God. His relationship to the Lord was not based on his performance, but on his covenant with Jesus Christ. John had not understood that mercy triumphs over justice. He had not known how great was his salvation in Christ, how great the grace of Jesus. As he said, grace is a gift that is given, not a wage that is earned. Righteousness is not remuneration for work well done. It doesn't come through human desire, human effort, or human accomplishment. It doesn't come through the merit of mankind, but through the mercy of God. Not by works, but by faith. And when we receive mercy, we are able to give mercy. I remind us of the words of the Apostle Peter. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So where are we on our spiritual journey? Have we come to Bethel and made an important but youthful conditional promise? Or are we near Peniel, where the struggle with God in the dark night of the soul ends with the brilliant sunrise of the glory of God in your heart. Where the old self dies and the new self is born. Are you near Peniel where Jacob becomes Israel? Where the love and the power and the beauty and the glory and the goodness and the joy of God floods your soul. It is a consummation devoutly to be desired. It is a gift beyond price. It is a gift which God, your Heavenly Father, waits to give to His children. May God bless you as you receive it. They that have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen.